Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. Great pleasure today for me to have with us Patrick McGee, who is with Financial Times out of San Francisco. Patrick is writing extensively about technology and specifically about Apple. He graciously accepted our invite today to join us and speak at length of a couple of very interesting topics. Patrick, pleasure to have you and thanks for joining us. Hi, Radu. Thanks. My pleasure to be here. Maybe let's let's start first and foremost about yourself. And I wanted to ask how and why did you end up writing a lot or being so focused on tech and on Apple in particular? Well, let's see. I've been at the Financial Times just more than 10 years. They hired me when I was a bond reporter in New York. They took me to Hong Kong, where I spent three years covering just all kinds of markets, launching something called Fast FT, which is our market moving desk, essentially. Then I spent three years in Germany. Germany, as you probably know, has has a whole host of supply chain companies, right? Most of all the the entire car world, right? The the Volkswagen, Daimler, and BMW in particular all make huge profits in China and also just deal with an extensive supply chain globally. And being a total like non-car person that was new to the world, I, I was actually really floored early on just to learn that like even with something you know as pricey and and and, and nice as a Porsche only something like 25% of the componentry within inside of Porsche would actually be from Porsche, right? Like everything was outsourced. And this has been the case for decades, but like I, I was I was just <laughs> new, new to the space and wasn't aware of that. Mm. After three years covering automotive, I, I moved to California to basically be our, our Apple reporter. There, there's some other things in that beat as well, dealing with hardware like autonomous cars, but it, I'm basically the Apple guy. Gotcha. And Apple now uh, switching to the main topic of our conversation today. So they've just announced Vision Pro. Let's start with that because that's the hot announcement. Then we go into the supply chain, more supply chain focused topic. So Vision Pro, what's your take on it? You know, I think the Vision Pro is sort of like the, the equivalent of, of Tesla's announcement of the Cybertruck a few years ago. What I mean by that is Tesla's image, I think, was at risk of looking a little bit more conventional because the Model 3 was this great mass market car. But then you have the Model Y. And the Model Y looked a lot like the Model 3, just happened to be more of an SUV shape, obviously. But if they then came out with a pickup truck that looked even like, you know, like a standard Ford F-150, I think you'd begin to have all sorts of media coverage that Apple, I'm sorry, that Tesla just was becoming a sort of standard company that just happened to have batteries instead of internal combustion engines. So instead, they come out with this totally futuristic, you know, like Hollywood 1980s movie type type vehicle. And I think it just completely prevented anyone having that approach or that view of Tesla, right? This was a revolutionary company that was going to continue to, you know, upend the world of designs and sort of take the world by storm and everything. And even though the presentation itself included someone throwing a baseball at the, you know, bulletproof glass or whatever that actually shattered, you know, I think nevertheless, it totally altered our projection or our, our perception rather of, of what Tesla was like. And I think Apple Vision Pro is a little bit like that, right? The image of Apple over the last five years, especially, is this company is just iterating on old ideas. You know, what have they really done since Steve Jobs passed away? Yes, they're a supply chain, you know, master. But in terms of fundamentally new designs, they don't seem to be doing all that much, right? So here they come out with the Vision Pro, and it's this $3,500 device. It could not be more sleek. I got to demonstrate it for 30 minutes. And I mean, really, it's just spectacular in numerous ways. And it's going to take a long time before it's actually really adding much revenue, let alone profit, to the bottom line. But I think it's achieved its purpose in the interim, which is just to to sort of like draw in more employees, right? Like like display Apple as as a as a great company that you should go work for if you're a top engineer, and really give the entire developer community a sense that Apple understands what the future is and is looking towards the post smartphone world, right, which is sort of a way of telling everybody that, you know, they are risking, they, they are willing to go into that innovators dilemma, where you'll cannibalize your own sales, rather than have anybody else do it. So you know, if mm. meta and others think that a headset is a new thing, Apple's going to get into that market and do a better job than anybody else. Mm. No, I love the love the analogy, didn't quite think it from that perspective. And indeed, at least Apple did not I think it was a ball that Elon Musk threw at the cyber cyber truck window and to prove that it was impenetrable and it did the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> what did I say? Baseballs, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was it was penetrable. Uh, at least uh, you know Tim Cook didn't didn't shatter the <laughs> Vision Pro. <laughs> yeah, their presentation was a little better. <laughs> but 
Now I'll, I'll just play a little bit, and I'll stick to this for just one question. I'll play a little bit on the AI topic, on the artificial intelligence topic, because if we go back to one, two years ago, a couple of things were super hot, including the metaverse. Obviously, these guys at Facebook changed the whole company name. To mirror that, we had a bunch of other things that were hot, but let's not go into the crypto space and NFT and so on. Now, in the last six months, six, 12 months, six months, yeah, around about six months, everything to do with artificial intelligence has completely just boomed. Like there's a, there's almost like, a, um, you know, an AI expert under every stone that you can turn and, and everybody's going full speed ahead on that. So I, I wanted to weave that in, you know, you have metaverse as a future trend, yes. And then, you know, obviously headsets don't necessarily need to, and, and Vision Pro and all the rest don't need to necessarily be tagged into the metaverse only. But that's that's kind of the big bigger play for them potentially in the future. And then you have artificial intelligence that has come and swept everything away. How do you see these forces playing playing through? And it doesn't have to be either or, yeah? But how do you kind of see artificial intelligence as a driving force into what happens in the tech world? Yeah, lots of people have noted that the word artificial intelligence or the, or the, or the abbreviation AI was not even mentioned in Apple's WWDC keynote. I don't know that there's a huge takeaway from that per se. Apple does a lot of things in secret. And they don't necessarily need to join a trend, you know, basically led by Microsoft and OpenAI, uh, Google as a, a sort of fast follower and probably the most dominant company in AI in general. I mean, first of all, there's just a couple things. One, a lot of us are still going to access these new tools through our hardware. And for most of us, the hardware, frankly, is Apple. So, I mean, if, you know, now that ChatGPT is on the App Store, if you're going to be purchasing from them, Apple will be taking its 30% cut, right? So, so even mm. if they sort of stood back and did nothing, they would still be earning revenue from this. Secondly, I mean, other than Siri... I don't know that Apple's really at risk of being sort of out innovated here. I say Siri just because it's a service that doesn't seemingly get any better year over year. I mean, frankly, it might even get worse. I might say the same thing about Amazon Alexa. And once you start having chat GPT with voice commands, you know, I, I don't know why you would rely on, on any of the incumbent technologies. They're, they're just a lot better. I mean, Satya Nadella said they're dumb as a rock to one of my colleagues, and mm. I'm, I'm inclined to agree. So I'm sure Apple's working on large language models. We just don't have a whole lot of details about what they're doing with them. But the other thing is that I guess it's a double-edged sword or, or something like that, wherein Apple wouldn't be able to come out with a technology like ChatGPT. I mean, if you've used ChatGPT, it gets a host of things wrong. I mean, just all the time. And we sort of understand, well, you know, it's a startup. Microsoft sort of has this perfect relationship where like <laughs> they're the ones who get the earliest access to the latest from ChatGPT, but we don't quite sort of like put the onus on, on Microsoft when there's something wrong. We sort of understand that it's a startup. Whereas if this was coming out of Apple, I mean, I think the media reaction would be totally different. I mean, we hold Apple to a whole different set of accounts that we do startups. I mean, just to get back to the Vision Pro stuff, just days before the Vision Pro was announced, I was at AWE, a big sort of conference for augmented reality. And I saw a host of technologies that were okay. But if Apple had showed me the exact same technology, I would have roasted them, right? I would have said this isn't remotely close to being ready for the consumer. And I think that sort of applies to AI as well, which is, you know, if it's not perfect, Apple is going to have a whole host of negative headlines. And so for the most part, a lot of this generative AI is ridiculously impressive, but also has a host of ethical concerns and stuff that basically if Apple were the company behind it, it would have a very different reputation, right? We, we would not allow Apple in a certain sense to have, have the technology. So I think it's perfectly fine for them to be working on this stuff in secret on the release mm. it when it's better. Mm. I mean, we've, we've got a taster of, of that with Google Bard. Yeah, I mean, when, when they released it and then Bard blew some, some super simple prompts and then yes. their stock went, <laughs> went pear-shaped. And yeah, I guess, I guess Apple is the standard for, for quality. So yeah. good point there. Now, switching it a little bit more to the supply chain side, you had a couple of months, I think, and, and that's how we initially connected, maybe six, 12, nine months ago. You talked about how Apple got trapped into China, and it was a super insightful article. I mean, I recommended it on LinkedIn, and I also recommend all our listeners to, to find it. What I wanted to ask you, Patrick, I think the, the stats in the article was that more than 92, 93 for most of the most of the products of Apple, the, the manufacturing is done out of China, yeah, through Foxconn, through whoever, but it is done out of China. 
Yes. And, and your argument was, uh, or may, maybe just summarize a little bit for those who haven't read it, summarize a little bit the key findings around how Apple, how you made the point that Apple got trapped into China. Yeah, I mean, the argument is basically that Tim Cook, who's the CEO, came into Apple in 1998 to lead worldwide operations. Within a few years, he's promoted to chief operating officer. And by the time Steve Jobs dies, there's really no tension within Apple as to who's going to lead the company. It's clearly Tim Cook. He's already been leading the company on a day-to-day -day basis in a certain sense and had been for, for years. Even though he wasn't a product visionary per se, he just knew so much about how to build and you know, well, how to create, how to build a sustained partnership with China and a whole bunch of companies within China to just build an absolutely world leading supply chain using an approach I don't think had really been done before and, and at, certainly at that scale since. So, you know, there was like when, when Tim Cook was announced as the next CEO, Wall Street wasn't a fan. I mean, Larry Ellison at the time said, we know what happens to Apple when Steve Jobs goes away. We've run this experiment before. And he, of, of course, pointed towards the past when 1985, when, when Steve Jobs went away and, and Apple a, a decade later is almost bankrupt, right? That's what he forecast. And instead, Apple went from around $350 billion valuation to 10 years later, hitting $3 trillion. The day that it hit $3 trillion, I should say, I calculated it. And Apple's market share had gone up by $700 million per day which mm. many readers thought, you know, to some extent appropriately, that that was a typo and, until some of them did their own math and shared it on social media. But I mean, it's a stunning success story under Tim Cook. And my main argument is that the biggest achievement of Apple over the last two decades has now become its biggest vulnerability because A, the world's leading supply chain, they didn't really anticipate the geopolitical shift, wherein Xi Jinping really took China in a different trajectory, wherein now China is becoming this authoritarian, estranged, more hostile state. And meanwhile, what they've created in, in China in terms of the sophistication, the scale, the quality of the supply chain, it really can't be replicated anywhere else. And, and that's not for a lack of trying. Apple has spent the last decade looking at other areas and basically found them wanting. Mm. Yes. And I think you were, so if I remember correctly, on the, the different products, so you had the iPhone, you had the laptops, you have what, I don't remember all the different four categories, but basically yeah. for the iPhones, I think 95% is China of the manufacturing. You did make a point that there's some that is they're trying to put it in India. Now, Mike, my, my, I want I do want to bring the question to: Do you see that succeeding? Do you see India succeeding at some point? And how long will it take to create a, an a truly alternative to China, if it's even possible at all? As a so manufacturer, yes, it, it is about ninety five percent of phones are made in China, and actually, I would say that number, as significant as that is, actually understates things because when you do have phones made in India or Brazil, the two other locations, they are largely going through the same process in China before they are then shipped to India, where they are then basically just do, undergoing final assembly. In other words. In China, you have something like 1,500 or 1,600 facilities that are all playing some role in a like just a real depth and breadth of the supply chain. Whereas in India, you don't really have any of that. You're just sort of shipping things over from China to India, meaning that you know India's trade surplus to to China is well, I shouldn't say the trade surplus. So the trade deficit is getting larger because they're taking mm -hmm. more from China and then just doing the assembly. So. It's not clear to me at all that Apple's motivation by making more things in Brazil or India has anything to do with a geopolitical recognition. It's more that both of those countries have 20% or so tariffs, and so they can avoid those tariffs and sell to the local market without it if they have their phones assembled there. What I'm really waiting for is for Apple to really demonstrate that they understand that Xi Jinping is not like his predecessors and that this experiment with China where the West was supposed to you know, encourage trade, encourage investment, and we were going to sort of manifest a democracy within the world's largest country. I mean, I think there's a pretty broad consensus. There's certainly one in Washington that that is a failed project. And mm. Washington has basically woken up to that. It's probably the most bipartisan issue in Congress, but Apple basically has not woken up to it and arguably to some extent cannot because they are not in a position to move their supply chain. Mm. No, exactly. That's you said it. I, I think I think they know very well. Cannot imagine that Tim Cook doesn't know extremely well what is going on in China. I think I think he cannot. <laughs> He's uh, like again the, using the word that you used, trapped. You cannot shift the complexity 
of those supply chains and manufacturing hubs and all that interconnectedness of all your tier one, two, three, four suppliers anywhere else. It's just impossible to do as it stands. So it's, yeah, it's I mean, a, let me just jump in to say one thing, which is that like if Tim Cook were to resign today, I think this would be the biggest issue for his successor. And yet, you know, but he's not resigning. So it remains the biggest issue even for him. And yet the Vision Pro headset that we just discussed, that is at least according to the Nikkei, I don't, I should say, I don't have my own original sourcing here. That is being assembled by Luxshare. So that's a Chinese company within mainland China. So it's it's not even Foxconn, which is Taiwanese. It's a, it's a mainland rival, sometimes known as mini Foxconn. And so, you know, if there were a genuine recognition that having all your eggs in one basket is, is a concern, you would think that the, the first post-smartphone technology that they are creating would maybe be built somewhere else. It is not. I think that's mm. very telling. Mm. And look, I mean, we, do, we don't know exactly the conditions also that the Chinese government have imposed to Apple because I, I, <laughs> I can imagine they, they, they know they're in a strong position with Apple. So they might have even made this a, a must, yeah, that Apple for the new technology <laughs> still partners with the, you know, with the local, local enablers like the company you just mentioned that is just uh, you know me being wildly um, assuming but i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised if that's the case now of course that does mean and we talked a little bit offline but let's bring the topic online that does mean that in the in the event of a potential conflict i mean let's not talk directly china us for a second even if it does seem that we are in some sort of a third you know third cold war or, or something because uh, the, the two countries are pretty much at each other's necks as much as they can but it's more likely that China and Taiwan, there's, there's some sort of, uh, it's even publicly declared by the Chinese government, I think their stand is that it, it will be, you know, Taiwan is part of China and it will be unified into China. If that happens, if anything happens on that front, already any company, any American company that deals with China will be greatly impacted. So how do you see things in, in that respect? If China does attack Taiwan, what happens for Apple? What happens for, for their supply chain? Yeah, so let me just start by saying, I, th I think it's a pretty easy argument to say that no company is as exposed to this problem as Apple. I'm sure some listeners might not get that right away, but this is what I would say. Apple is the largest company in the world. It makes about $400 billion of revenue per year. 80% of that is hardware, and 95% of that figure is all made in China, right? On top of that, 100% of Apple's chips that they design are all manufactured by TSMC in Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's sort of anything like a quarantine on Taiwan, Apple would be at risk of, of getting chips for the next iPhone, right? Or iPad or any of its computers. So in the event that there's any sort of issue there, Apple has a, a serious risk, right? I mean, just, just, just huge in a way that other companies would absolutely be impacted. But Samsung, for instance, its biggest rival, and in fact, the only company that makes more phones than Apple, their manufacturing operations are in six countries. Their chips are made out of Korea. And a lot of other things are done in Korea as well, right? And, and they don't manufacture phones in China. So they are far less exposed. They also have a sort of easier assembly process. So Android phones typically only have 100 people in the production line, whereas Apple has 10 times that, right? 1,200 people. So the complexity of Apple's supply chain is what allows it to be sort of like a luxury product that at the same time is, is handcrafted and built for the masses, right? Something that you don't have in, let's say, the automotive industry. But if there were to be a major geopolitical blow up with China or Taiwan, the easier manufacturing capabilities of, of Samsung might very well be an asset, right? The only other thing I would say is I don't like going into the rabbit hole of what happens to Apple if there's legitimately a war between the US and China over Taiwan. And the reason I say that is just that if that were the risk, or, or rather, sorry, if that were the scenario, I'm worried about nuclear weapon proliferation, right? I'm worried about San Francisco blowing up. I, I don't think the speed of the processor for the next iPhone is going to be on the top 10 list of anyone's concerns if the two superpowers go to war. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Fair, fair observation, Patrick. And how do you see specifically on the, now shifting again, you know, just reading into the future, which as we know, it's a very dangerous and, and almost never, never do we get it <laughs> right. See Larry Ellison, you mentioned <laughs> earlier, but how do you see it playing out? And not, not only for Apple, but yeah, for the other technology companies in the next three years, what do you think is likely to happen as big trends? 
So yeah, of course, it's ridiculously impossible to, to say what the future is going to hold. I think what I would say is more and more you are seeing companies uncouple or at least de-risk from China a little bit. And I really don't think you're seeing that from Apple. I mean, I'm considerably less optimistic than others. There are lots of headlines about Apple diversifying into Vietnam and into India, but I think there's far less substance if you, if you really start looking at it. On the other hand, if you look at other companies like Amazon or Microsoft, companies like Magic Leap that are building you know, competitors to the Vision Pro, they're not doing a whole lot in China. And they, they have moved their operations from China over the last 10 years. And so it's really going to be a question of how isolated is Apple? Because it's hard to put too much blame on Apple for doubling down on China when in fact, mm. all of us, like literally 240 million people a year are buying the iPhone knowing that it's built in China, right? So in other words, the blame is sort of spread around. Like if consumers don't care that something's made in China, then Apple doesn't necessarily need to care. But if other companies are, are, are really diversifying, like someone like Dell, Michael Dell, is trying to put a whole host of more manufacturing in India versus China because his consumers want it. And if there's a shift among consumer sentiment to actually prioritize that, and then Apple's isolated, then I think, of course, you're going to have a major problem there, or you're going to see a more acceleration on the part of Apple. So there's a lot of moving parts there. But on the whole, I don't see Apple making big moves. I'm aware of the headlines. I've read the same stories everybody else has. But you know, as one Apple source told me, it's it's hand waving. It's it's look at us, look at us. We're diversifying to India, but really we're not. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And so I don't know to what extent that is going to change over the next few years. But even if it does, I don't know that it actually sort of eats away at the big risk. So let's say, for instance, that by 2030, 50 percent of iPhones, right, which is like there's no chance this is going to happen essentially. But let's say 50 percent of iPhones are made outside of China. To what extent does that really even solve the issue? I mean, does that allow Tim Cook to support pro-democracy protesters in China? I don't think so. I mean, arguably, he would still have, you know, half of maybe 450 or 500 billion dollars of products being built in China. So with that sort of exposure, I don't see how that would really change the position that Apple's in now. Yes. And just keeping it pragmatic, do you even see any place on this planet so even if he was to let, let's say to be resolute to to make a, a de-risking or you know build somewhere else but is there such a place where they, he could actually get the same quality the same speed the same even if not from day one but maybe over one two three years do you see such a country that even exists today yeah, so I want to be clear. I, I mean, look, one reason that I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to get out of this podcast, right? One thing I'm hoping to get out of the podcast is that you've got a whole host of supply chain people that will hopefully listen to this. And I would love for them to call me up and disagree with me, right? Send me an email, right? So hopefully you can put this in the show notes because I don't want to be dogmatic here. I'm, I'm a reporter. I mean, I get opinions from the research and, and certainly I get to speak to lots of experts and they inform me. But I'm always open to new ideas. I'm certainly open to being wrong. And on this point, I mean, I'm saying I'm, I'm pessimistic, but I would love to be proven wrong. But here's my stance as it stands now. The similarities that people see between India and China, I think, are pretty superficial, which is to say they each have more than a billion people. India's wages are something like that of China's 15 years ago, and they're trying to build up more manufacturing. And under Narendra Modi, there is a whole lot of government support for this sort of stuff. So, right. So lots of people see those reasons and think, oh, I mean, India could absolutely be the next big base for Apple manufacturing. Then when you really get into the nitty gritty details, though, I think a lot of this argument, if it doesn't fall apart entirely, it certainly seems to get a whole lot more challenging. So, for instance, it's not just that you have a lot of people in China. It's that you have this culture of migration, right? We're all familiar with the fact that hundreds of millions of people have moved from the hinterlands to the coast, places like Shanghai, places like Shenzhen, to do a whole host of manufacturing jobs. And what Foxconn was able to do, especially in the early years, was not so much offer cheap labor, but offer flexible labor, right? So Apple would be charged for the labor in the lead up to the Christmas season. But then when they don't need so many phones in January, February, those workers just aren't on the payroll and Apple doesn't have to pay them. So you had like more than 100 million people who participate in these migratory schemes that are government backed, wherein governments, government licensed buses literally go into the rural hinterlands and recruit people so that Foxconn has enough hands when, whenever it needs them. 
you don't really have anything like that in India. I mean, there really just is not a big culture of migration. And so even if you have a city with a, with a lot of people, it's not clear that they're going to be able to fill the factories, not just on day one, but over and over and over, because these jobs are not fun. No one's going to say, you know, putting a camera module onto an iPhone for 12 hours a day is a great job. It might pay well versus what else is available in India. But it's difficult to do that year in, year out. And so you have massive churn in these factories. And China can support that because they have massive churn in the cities themselves. But there was a study a few years ago that looked at migratory patterns within countries. There were 80 countries in the study, and India was dead last in terms mm. of people moving around. So it's, you know, like sometimes what you'll hear, and it sounds like a good argument, is like, hey, if Tim Cook could do it in China, he could do it anywhere. I think that severely underestimates everything from the Confucian work ethic in China to the government support to, uh, you know, just like the, the hurdles that they were able to overcome because they were really coming off of 100 years of humiliation, as, as the Chinese call it, and really wanting to prove themselves. I think they had a long term strategy of using manufacturing to help become a superpower. And there was just such willpower to get it done and a, and a cohesion and a compliance to get it done. And I just don't know where else you're going to find that. I should, this is the point at which I should mention Vietnam. Vietnam has a lot of those attributes. The problem is really just that it's small. And what's great about Vietnam is essentially that it's just close to, it's so close to China. So all the mm. electronics manufacturing you have in Vietnam is in Northern Vietnam. And the only reason that's really conceivable that I can think of is that it's, it's all close to China, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so it's not that all like the raw materials and minerals and whatnot are all coming from Vietnam. They're still basically coming from China. And so, you know, I've, I've said elsewhere, this sort of calls into question how diversifying, like what, or what sort of true diversification this is if you're diversifying to Vietnam, because you're basically getting everything from China, but it's actually assembled in Vietnam. But even there, like the port structures aren't as mature. And so, you know, in, in days when you have bad weather, like all the ports in Vietnam can be closed, whereas China would have a hell of a lot more options and whatnot. So, mm. yeah, anyway, that's a long winded answer. But the short answer is I'm open to disagreement. I'm open to being proven wrong. In a sense, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see another country on par with China or even on a path to get there in the next few years. And then just one final point, of course, while you're trying to do this, China still exists, right? I mean, in the early 2000s, when China was becoming a manufacturing power base, they were doing so without a country the size of China competing with them, right? Whereas now, if India is trying to do it, they have to compete with with, with Beijing. And Beijing isn't just going to stand by as com companies like Apple say, we're moving all our manufacturing to India, right? They're, they're going to respond. Yes, uh, makes perfect sense. And, and, and on the point here, we just to emphasize for our listeners so patrick is super approachable you can find him on linkedin he's always looking for good sources good chats good experts so do reach out to him i think you've seen so far how passionate he is about technology in general and about apple in particular so just make making sure and reinforcing that point point. and maybe a, a last question for you patrick on the point of manufacturing has been seen as the ugly child for a long long time we talked about the smile you know there's that image with the smile where you know the smile shaped where the marketing the retail the pr everything is is very is supposed to be very high end and high in value whereas the manufacturing is kind of the ugly kid yeah and it has been treated like this for many years by many companies and perhaps that's also what has led and has accelerated the rise of china because they focused on the right thing now obviously after covid a lot of countries and companies have woken up oh no actually manufacturing is important is key let's bring it close you know to to our shores let's let's regionalize let's bring it home we ourselves as executive search firm have worked on a couple of projects specifically i mean i can even name in in us you know there's a lot of for chips yeah there's huge activities in texas in arizona to make semiconductors and huge facilities from okay if something happens in taiwan and something happens to tsmc you know then us doesn't want to to be left with no semiconductors but Finding the talent to manage those manufacturing hubs, which are huge, by the way, and if if our listeners know on the semiconductor side, it's one, it's huge facilities, huge investments. Two, the skills are extremely hard to find, and they have stopped existing in the US for the last twenty years at minimum. So there, therein lies the challenge, because a lot of places didn't have or stopped having manufacturing focus both in the European Union as well as in the US. 
you mm -hmm. can't easily just teleport talent <laughs> or data dump knowledge to the brains of people to operate this huge facility. So that also makes it quite dif difficult and you need to, again, import this talent from somewhere. So just want to get also your thoughts, what you've seen from this perspective with this manufacturing, sometimes, yes, Amazon and Google and, and who not have shifted and have the risks, but how easy is it to find the people in those markets to run it? So let's see. So I'm, I'll try not to give too complicated an answer. W one thing is just one thing I worry about is that the last three or four decades of purely focusing on design, marketing, branding, PR, and treating manufacturing as something that could be done by others, that looks, to, we, we look to be at some sort of inflection point where we're seeing the problems of that approach. The car world is an interesting one because aside from Tesla, America isn't doing all that well at electric vehicles, nor, nor is Germany, I should say. I was in Germany covering it for years. None of them have produced EVs at the scale or quality that I thought they were going to when I was reporting from 2016 to 2019. And they had all the reason in the world because the Volkswagen diesel emission scandal had just happened. You had new leadership and there was a huge, huge drive. So even with a massive push, they're finding it quite difficult. Whereas China is really leading on EVs. I believe more than half of all EVs built last year were all done in China. And they're exporting them to other parts of the world. And I think you're going to have more Chinese brands, which is you know a substantial shift. I mean, you, you try to think of last time you saw a Chinese brand on the highway, at least in America. I mean, there are none. There's literally none. But I think that could change substantially. And the only reason it wouldn't change, I, I, I believe, is, is policies to, to not let that happen, right? But in terms of just like the, the quality and the pricing, it's all there. So I really do wonder to what extent there's going to be a massive shift in terms of how the United States thinks about this, not just CEOs, not just executives, but the government, right? And you're already seeing that with, with the CHIPS Act, right? Where you have subsidies yeah. for building high-tech facilities here. Basically, there's a recognition that we can't just have this all being done by our geopolitical rival. I mean, that's just a, a weird state to be in. I mean, just to give you a, for instance, of just how different, you know, the new Cold War between the US and China is towards the last Cold War, Apple sends more Apple goods from China to the US per year than the Soviet Union sent to America in the four decades of the Cold War. And like, in other words, there was virtually no trade between the Soviet Union and the USSR, whereas the trade between the China and, and US is just absolutely incredible. So everything you think about the previous Cold War really doesn't apply because of the economic interdependency here. I mean, Elon Musk said it well recently. He said, it's like, you know, if you want to decouple these economies, it's like performing surgical operation between conjoined twins, right? The risk is yeah. that both die. Sad metaphor, but but I mean, that really is the state of the state of things. The only other thing I should mention is just that one big possibility here, of course, is to assemble the iPhone in a completely different way, and indeed other products in a completely different way. So Apple's process over the last 20 years has been very labor intensive. And it's in part because the labor has been cheap, it's plentiful, and it's been available. So why not structure the design of the iPhone around having 1,200 people in a line being able to put every component in place and polish it? You know, one former design engineer once said, they wanted the iPhone 4 to look like it had been licked by thousands of kittens, right? That's the sort of approach that you have when that sort of labor is so ubiquitous. You could definitely see shifts happening in the next people is deciding to design the phone in a certain way so that it can be built in a more automated fashion. And if they are able to pull that off, then you really don't need to have everything in China. I mean, a lot of the raw materials and so forth are still going to come from China, but if you think of the fact that more and more iPhones are being recycled, so we already have the components, like in terms of the, you know, you can have a, a closed loop, right? A circular loop of the components rather than having to mine new materials, then you could automate things in a different fashion. And so if you're able to do that, then actually it's it's less that the jobs would come back to the US because we're not really thinking of the jobs per se. I mean, a lot less jobs are needed if you're just sort of running an assembly line controlled by robots but the manufacturing could come back and it would be high value jobs. And then you could have it manufactured basically in the markets where you're selling, right? So you could have this manufacturing being done in Europe, in the US, in Brazil, et cetera. It wouldn't have to all be based in China. I'm not terribly optimistic that that's going to happen in the short term, but whenever I ask experts if this is the case in 20 years, I mean, it's just like nodding heads in unison. Everyone believes this is the case in two decades. I just don't know that anybody knows mm. it's the case in five or 10 years. Mm. Well said. Well, on that note, Patrick, 
has been insightful. Thanks a lot for your uh, for your perspectives. Keep sharing with the world this great analysis and, and articles that you write about tech and Apple in general. And it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks, Radu. I really appreciate it. And to any of your listeners, I would just say I'm intensely interested in the history, the present and the future here. So if you have any former experience building phones or electronics for the likes of Motorola, Nokia, of course, Apple, Samsung, etc., I'd absolutely love to hear from you. Super. Thanks, Patrick. Cheers, Radu. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcodglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also, subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.